we hinted last time at these different ways that we can optimize pump performance. And before we get into them, we need to talk a little bit about the affinity laws. So there's a, a set of governing principles around centrifugal pump parameters. Parameters like flow, impeller speed, impeller size or diameter, head or pressure, and then the brake horsepower to that pump. There's different ways that these variables interact, and they follow either proportional square or cubic laws. So when we look at things like speed, diameter of the impeller, and the resulting flow, there's going to be a linear relationship based on these laws that where you make one change, you're going to have a proportional change in the other variable. There's square laws where we bring head into it, and where we have those original variables, speed, diameter, and flow change, there's a square relationship between the resulting head change. And finally, and, and of, of most note, is this brake horsepower change and the cubic relationship between those variables. So, as an example, if you were in an instance where you could reduce your flow by half, the resultant brake horsepower would be diminished by half of a half of a half, or one-eighth of the original brake horsepower. So there's some significant opportunities for energy savings based on this cube law, but just to go back to the square law and the relationship between head and flow, one more thing of note is that if we were able to chart these two variables, we would expect the relationship between them to look like a parabola shape. So we looked last time at the pump curve and how many variables are really jammed into this thing. And if you need to, go back to that video and we can review the actual makeup of this chart. But we want to look now is what that parabola looks like. So if we have a design operating point and an impeller size selected based on the pressure expected and the design flow required. Rather than just having an operating point, what we actually have is this system curve. And the reason we have this shape is because of the square relationship between flow and head. So the key takeaway here is that the operating point of your pump, so where on this chart the pump is operating, is going to be determined by the intersection of that system curve and the impeller curve for the impeller size selected. So if the designer had selected a different impeller for the same system, you can see where the actual operating point would be based on that new intersection. So let's say we have actual performance that's different than what the designer expected. So based on the actual performance, what that essentially means is that there's a system curve based on all the pressure losses in the distribution that looks more like this. It's less steep. And this is your actual system curve. And the actual operating point lies on its intersection with the impeller size in your system. So what can we do with this information? And what does it mean when we talk about pump optimization? Well, there's really two main options. The first one is to find some way to increase the system pressure to be able to provide the design flow that's required. So essentially what you're doing is steepening your curve. And we would call that throttling. And that's essentially what we do when we balance a pump with a discharge valve by constricting its opening. And the other option that we have available to us is to find a way to ride that system curve down and try to find a new operating point that meets the GPM requirement at a reduced pressure. And we might call this trim performance. And this can happen either with speed reduction of your pump or with an impeller size reduction inside your pump. So returning to the four options that we have available, really the two that are going to leverage this cube relationship from the affinity laws is going to be the impeller trim and the VFD. There's a fourth option for replacing the pump, and this is essentially going to be going back to the drawing board, knowing your actual system curve, and trying to perfectly select the pump that is going to be most efficient for that condition. But throttling is really the most common that's done in practice. So when a pump is initially installed and balanced, when you have this condition where you ran out your curve a little bit, 
a tab individual might come and throttle down the discharge valve right downstream of that pump to get you to your design operating point. And this actually will save a little bit of energy. You can see because of the closer relationship with the peak efficiency and with the flow reduction, even with the artificial pressure drop, you might have some incremental savings and you're meeting design flow. So it is a type of optimization. But really the optimization that we may want to consider as part of something like a recommissioning opportunity is to be able to leverage those affinity laws and ride down the system curve for an enhanced amount of brake horsepower savings. So let's look at an example from the field. So let's say you walk up to one of these triple duty valves, a discharge valve right downstream of the pump, and you notice that there is some amount of throttling happening, or possibly because of the level of insulation, maybe you can't read it. So you might have some clue there that the pump might have been overestimated for the head that that pump would see. Perhaps you're aware of some design modification. So in this example, we had a building that was initially designed to have five floors, but through a design option that was lost, it ended up being reduced to four floors, but not all of the HVAC equipment had its sizing reduced accordingly. And let's say that you, hands in your pocket, walked through the system and did some impromptu head calcs based on what you might expect with, in this case in the chill water system, a chiller evaporator barrel pressure drop, that of the coil, an equal size for the control valve, a little bit of what you could tell by the length of piping in the system and the expected friction, and then some incremental addition for the pipe friction with the valves and the fittings. So say you come up with a number that is non-trivially less than what you see on the pump nameplate and what was installed based on the design expectation. Well, this might be enough to not know for sure, but to be suspicious that you might have an oversized pump, and that might instigate some type of testing to validate that hypothesis. So based on the pump nameplate, you'd go and get the pump curve. And you may start with an assumption based on what the as-builds or what the nameplate says the installed impeller size is. So in this case, we had some documentation that told us what the design was and what the commission state was recorded at. But based on our impromptu head calc, not only did we have less flow because of the design modification, but we had far less pressure that we expected in our system. We noted the operating condition. We did a deadhead pump test to validate that the impeller size was as it was indicated. And then we looked at the full open condition. So fully opening that triple duty valve, removing as much of that pressure drop as we could to see what the system curve looked like. And based on the affinity laws, we can draw that in as such. So what does this tell us? Well means that if we had this impeller size for that same pump, that this would be our trimmed or optimized operating point. We can meet the GPM that we actually needed in the system, and we can do it at a far less amount of pressure. So as a kind of preliminary energy savings ballpark, we can look at the lines of brake horsepower and understand that we can expect about a four brake horsepower savings opportunity by trimming this impeller. And when we say tr impeller trim, that's actually what we mean. We mean physically opening the pump up, sending it to something like a machine shop, and trimming it to the diameter indicated from the pump curve. So this opportunity deals with the diameter reduction laws that we see from these affinity equations. What a variable frequency drive, or VFD, does is leverage these same relationships, but using speed reduction. So I won't cover exactly how a VFD operates, so follow the link if you'd like to know more detail about the operation of these devices. But we're essentially intercepting a power signal, converting it to DC, making the change, and then more or less reconverting it back to AC as the reduced signal to facilitate a speed reduction at the pump impeller. So on the pump curve, the VFD optimization opportunity looks very similar to the impeller trim. There's two big differences that we'll note. One is that it's reversible, or I should say easily reversible. With the pump impeller trim, once you trim that impeller, it's pretty difficult to go back. 
you'd have to open the pump back up, buy a new impeller at the original size or a different size, and then install that. But with the VFD, you have these very easy reversible speed changes. So even if you don't have an automatic varying speed change in your system and you're just trimming it and leaving it at that new constant reduced speed, if you ever have a design change or if you ever need to course correct back up to a higher speed, you can accommodate that really easily with a VFD. The other big difference is that because you're not changing the impeller size and you're not increasing the gap between the tip of the impeller and the volume chamber casing, you're actually taking these lines of efficiency with you. So wherever you operated at that initial condition, you still have that uh, as close as you were to the peak efficiency with you at the new VFD operating point. So there's a lot of dynamics that would determine what the best opportunity would be for your system. It's going to depend a lot on your pump size, how often you run it, your local cost for something like a machine shop impeller trim or new VFD installation. Putting a, a different pump may be contingent on not being able to pursue one of these changes or having a pump at the end of its life. And there's different pros and cons associated with each of these. So you really need to consider the particular dynamics and economics of your particular system. But looking at one of these pump optimization opportunities is something we want to consider in a retro commissioning assessment. And with that, we'll take a look briefly at primary secondary systems before we start investigating some of the features of our airside systems.